thank you, Dr. Ajay Kumar, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, and also to all the academics who are present here to listen to me and also to, in some sense, share uh, the joy of remembering uh, a major academic like Dr. P.K. Rajan, whom all of us knew in one way or another. When I suggested this theme for the memorial lecture, uh, I was told maybe it would be good to speak on a topic related to Marxism. Uh, maybe I could do that, but I, I then suddenly remembered a story uh, which Louis Aragon, the great uh, French, uh, you know, poet, uh, critic, and uh, fiction writer, once said. Uh, there was a man who hated politics and who did not even want to take the word politics in his life. And he hated politicians like anything. But he one day fell victim to a peculiar kind of paralysis. And after being pa paralytic, he could speak only one word, politics. And by using that word, he had to express whatever he wanted. I mean, even if he wanted water or food or, you know, uh, clothes or uh, 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 books or whatever, he had to express everything by pronouncing the word politics uh, 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 in different ways with the different intonations. Well, that is a kind of metaphoric story, uh, which in a sense, tells us a lot about uh, where we are today, because there is hardly any topic we can discuss where politics in some way does not come in. I mean, it could be direct, it could well be oblique. And in the case of the topic that I have chosen, I, I chose it deliberately for political reasons, as well as uh, 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 it being one of the major areas of my own uh, interest and uh, research. So, so today too, I think uh, the topic is obliquely political. Uh, that's why I termed it uh, a case for plurality. Because this is the time when plurality, diversity, in every sense, in every dimension is being challenged by those who govern the country. Our ethnic plurality, our religious plurality, our linguistic plurality, our cultural plurality. I think all forms of diversity are in the extreme danger of standardization. There is an attempt, a very conscious, deliberate attempt to construct a monolithic India, a mono-religious India, a mono-ethnic India, uh, uh, to, to make it short, uh, to cut it short, uh, uh, a, an Aryan Hindu India, where, if possible, only one language would be spoken, or at least that language would dominate, where the re various regional cultures, which have all contributed to what we today call Indian culture, are either marginalized, suppressed or silenced. So there is an attempt to create a, a standardized India, uh, an India where voices of opposition, voices of dissent, voices of difference are continually suppressed. And that is obviously a sign of growing authoritarianism and the decadence of democracy with which uh, all, all of us Democrats are profoundly concerned. And it is, it is in this context that I wanted to speak about the plurality of Indian literature. Because generally, we speak of Indian literature in the singular. In fact, I myself had to edit a journal called Indian Literature for four years in the Sahitya Academy. And very often I had to, and even now I have to, use the word Indian literature in singular. But even when I use the word in singular, I have in mind an idea of Indian literature, which is inclusive, which actually refers to so many literatures, written, oral, performed, various forms of literatures, 
which together create what a, a body, a corpus of literature, which can be called Indian literature for the sake of convenience, if, if not for anything else. So ultimately, our literature is plural, and uh, you know, Ramanujan used to quote uh, uh, an Irish, uh, uh, an Irish joke, uh, where they, uh, I mean, a joke about Irish trousers, uh, where they say that I, uh, the Irish trousers, or like any trousers, in fact, uh, are uh, plural at the bottom and singular at the top, and. Ananda Murthy, uh, who was my uh, great friend and uh, my mentor in a, in, a, in a sense, often used to uh, quote this whenever he spoke of Indian literature. Well, uh, single, it looks single at the top, but once you come to the bottom, once you come to the regional cultures and regional languages, once you come to specific authors in the languages, the specific trajectories of the evolution uh, of the various kinds of trends and movements, or the specific texts in the languages, you find that it is uh, plural, plural uh, in, an, in, a, in an extremely unique way. A, a, a plurality which is almost inexpressible and which uh, cannot be compared even to the plurality of what we call European literature, which after all is expressed in maybe seven or eight languages. But that is not the case of Indian literature. We have so many languages, we have so many different regional cultures, and every language means also a world view, and we have several ways of expression, several forms of literature, and only when we are able to invoke every one of these forms and genres and movements and trends and worldviews can we ever think of uh, uh, something called Indian literature. So this is exactly what uh, uh, the, the, the major argument that I'm going to put forward with my own uh, uh, reasons and my own explanation. And to, uh, and to begin with, again, I'll go back to A.K. Ramanujan, who is one of my favorite thinkers, uh, because he has uh, uh, thought deeply and profoundly about uh, Indian literature and the relationship of the little traditions and, the, and, and, and what he calls the uh, great tradition. And that's a story he retells very often, uh, a story uh, uh, from the Kannada folklore. It is, it's a story about Rama, like many stories in India. And there are many stories about Rama too, and not a single story. Again, it is also being reduced to a single story today. Uh, so, uh, and this story, in some sense, is a kind of introduction to what I'm going to say. One day, Ram was uh, seated on his throne in Ayodhya, along with all his uh, advisors, the great, uh, the wise sages, the rishis, and also his uh, earnest messenger, his faithful follower, Hanuman. And while he was engaged in a philosophical discourse with the sages, the, the, the ring on his index finger fell down and, and disappeared through a hole on the floor. No one knew where, where exactly it went. And there was only one person who could perhaps retrieve this ring and that was not, none other than Hanuman. So the king asked Hanuman, kindly go and fetch that ring for me, because as you very well know, Hanuman had this special power uh, to become as huge as uh, the Mount Himalaya or as small as a mosquito. So Hanuman became small, almost microscopic, and went through that hole, and he reached the netherworld, and he met the emperor of the netherworld. Of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, details which I am leaving out, like uh, uh, the... Uh, the cooks uh, uh, of the emperor found this new animal uh, falling down from the earth and uh, put him also on the dinner platter of uh, the, the, the emperor of the netherworld, thinking this is a new animal and our king is sure to like it. So the, when, the, when the king sat for dinner, he heard someone chanting Ram Ram from the plate. He looked uh, intently at the dinner platter and asked that uh, insect-like being, who are you? Why are you calling the name of Ram? And then he said, I am Hanuman, the faithful messenger, uh, the pious Hanuman, uh, coming, from, uh, coming all the way from Ayodhya to fetch a ring that my master had lost. And the ring had probably come here because it had fallen through a, 
uh, a hole through which I came, and so I reached here, at the, and, the, and the ring is sure to have reached here. And then the king, to the great surprise of Hanuman, brought to him a whole big platter of golden rings. And he said, all these rings belong to Rama. And you can, if you can, retrieve your Rama's ring and take it back to your master. Hanuman looked closely at the rings. All of them looked alike. And he couldn't discover the particular ring of his particular Ra. Then the king of the netherworld said, Hanuman, a lot of Rams have been and are going to be. And whenever one Ram dies or disappears or attains salvation, whatever way you see it, or enters the river Sarayu, his ring, just before that, his ring falls down and comes here. And I have collected all those rings of various Rams who have appeared on earth until now. And I am sure many more Rams are going to appear on earth from, from now on. And Hanuman went back disappointed. And he found that as the king of the netherworld had prophesied, Ram had disappeared. He had entered Sarayu, and uh, after enthroning, uh, of course, uh, Lau and Kush, his uh, sons, as the kings of Ayodhya. Ekera Marjan tells this story as a kind of introduction to his famous essay, 300 Ramayanas, you know, which is included in Paula Richman's great book, The uh, Ramayana, a South Asian tradition. I repeated in some sense this story only to say how this story becomes again a kind of allegory for the plurality of Indian literature. If there are so many Rams, there must also be so many Ramayanas. And there really are. AKR, I mean, AK Ramanujan speaks only of uh, 300 Ramayanas, uh, but Paula Richman speaks of many more. And after that, Ramayanas continue to be discovered not only in India. So one thing to be understood about Ramayana is that it is not a single text. It is the name of a tradition. The second thing is that it is not an Indian text. It is a South Asian text. Because there are Ramayanas in Sumatra, in Bali, in Philippines, in Indonesia, in every South Asian country. Not one, but many Ramayanas in each of these countries. And within India, of course, there are hundreds of Ramayanas. Oral Ramayanas, written Ramayanas, performed Ramayanas, painted Ramayanas. And if you take all of them, they will run into thousands. So Ramayana, as it is sometimes made out today by certain protagonists of the, of the theory of Hindutva, is not a single text or a or even a single tradition and there is no single ram i'm not entering that uh, area it, it is of course one of my very special areas the study of ramayana and the study of the bhakti tradition are two of my very significant areas of research and study so i am not uh, going to speak about all those ramayanas i would just just uh, mention two or three things that would uh, make you realize how diverse these ramayanas are you know, what is common to these Ramayanas uh, 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 is perhaps the presence of certain characters. There is Dasharatha, there are the Kuns, there are the brothers, Ram and his brothers, there is Hanuman, there is Ravan, there is Sita. In all these Ramayanas, this, this is what is common. But there are Ramayanas where it is not Ram who fights Ravan, but it is Lakshman. Like, uh, uh, like the Jain Ramayana, Pauma Charita, or the Buddhist Ramayana, uh, which is, uh, uh, the, the, there are many Buddhist Ramayanas. One is, uh, the, the important one is called uh, Dasharatha Jataka, you know, Jataka is the story of the, uh, of one of the Bodhisattvas, and that is what you call the Jataka tales, the stories of the various Janmas, or the various births of uh, Bodhisattva. So, in Dasharatha Jataka, and in Pauma Charya, the Jain Ramayana, Pauma Charya means, 
Patmacharita. Bhavmacharita is, is the Pali word for Patmacharita. Uh, so in both these Ramayanas, it is not Rama who fights because Ram is a is committed to non-violence. He cannot fight a war. He is a he is a sannyasin. And so it is his brother Lakshman who fights and kills Ravan. And uh, 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 so that, that is that is just to show one example uh, of the difference. And there are many Ramayanas where Sita is uh, Ravan's daughter. So their relationship happens to have a kind of uh, uh, Oedipal uh, complication or an Oedipal suggestion. There is a Telugu folk Ramayana where Ra Ravan takes the form of a woman called Ravula and gives birth to Sita. Uh, and then this Sita is thrown away in a field and uh, Sita is discovered from the, from the, uh, the, the plow mark, you know, uh, by, the, by the King Janaka. So uh, she, uh, but without knowing this, very much like a Greek uh, tragic hero, uh, you know, who has one flaw, but who is otherwise very great, Ravana falls in love with or uh, gets attracted to Sita, and that is the end of him. Uh, so, so he is, of course, he is very much like a uh, like a uh, like a Greek hero in in many Ramayanas, including the Tamil Ramayana, the, the Kampa Ramayana, of of uh, of which we have some partial translations. Uh, because in Kamparamayana also, uh, uh, he is a, a devotee of Shiva. He is a great uh, musician. He is a Vainik. Uh, he plays uh, uh, divine Veena. And he is a wonderful scholar. But uh, his only weakness was uh, he uh, happened to fall in love with the wife of a man. A man who also happened to be a, a, a very important man <laughs> called uh, Ram, who was, a, who was the king of Ayodhya, according to some Ramayanas. He was the king of Kashi, according to some other Ramayanas. So uh, that that is another another difference, and so there are there are so many uh, so many Ramayana. There is one Ramayana where Rama has a sister a sister called Shanta, who is a major character. That is a written Ramayana in uh, in in Telugu, and uh, and and even in Kerala there are 197 Ramayanas according to a conservative estimate, and these Ramayanas are. Not all written. Of course, we have the Ram, uh, we have uh, the Kannasha Ramayana, we have uh, the Ramacharism, we have Athyatma Ramayana, we have many. Uh, the, the, we have a Mopala, Mopala Ramayana, uh, 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 which is written in uh, a kind of Arabic or Mopala Malayalam. We have the Vainadan Ramayana, which is a tribal Ramayana, where Sita is a tribal woman. Uh, whom Rama meets when she is coming down a hill with a bundle of wood on her head. Uh, so, uh, and besides that, we have several Atakathas, we have several Ottantullals, we have uh, several, uh, you know, uh, uh, folk, uh, folk uh, songs or folk narratives based on various episodes in Ramayana. And uh, they together come to 197, but I'm sure there are many more. If you also take into account various modern texts, like the various Ramayana stories written by Sarah Joseph, from the point of view of the women characters of, uh, of, of, of Ramayana, or the various uh, uh, po uh, poems written ar around the characters of uh, of, 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 of Ramayana uh, by many poets, uh, you know, right from Asha, Ashan's Sinda Vishtriya Sita to, uh, to, to ONB Swayamvaram or even to some of my own poems, you will find there are hundreds of poems written uh, based on Ramayana. There are literally hundreds of texts even in a comparatively small language like Malayalam based on Ramayana and there are several Ramayanas in all the languages of India, besides, as I said, in all the languages of uh, South Asia. As I said, it is not a Hindu tradition. I have seen, I have watched uh, Ramayana being played by Muslims from Bangladesh in, in Delhi when they came to a Sark festival, which I had organized in Delhi. I have seen Muslim poets of Malaysia reciting their own versions of uh, Ramayana in a poet's meet. Again, that happened in uh, Delhi, uh, in whose organization also I happen to have a role. So, and there are there are 
ക്രിസ്ത്യൻ പോയറ്റ്സ് ഇൻസ്പയർഡ് ബൈ രാമായണ യുനോ ദർ ആർ ക്രിസ്ത്യൻ വേർഷൻസ് ഓഫ് രാമായണ ഇൻ കൺട്രീസ് ലൈക്ക് ഫിലിപ്പീൻസ് സോ ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് നോട്ട് എ ഹിന്ദു ട്രഡീഷൻ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് എ മൾട്ടി റിലീജിയസ് ട്രഡീഷൻ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് നോട്ട് എൻ ഇന്ത്യൻ ട്രഡീഷൻ ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് എ മൾട്ടി നാഷണൽ നാഷണൽ ട്രഡീഷൻ ഓർ എ സൗത്ത് ഏഷ്യൻ ട്രഡീഷൻ ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് നോട്ട് എ സാൻസ്ക്രിറ്റ് എപ്പിക് റിട്ടൺ ബൈ വാൽമീകി എ ലോൺ ബട്ട് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് റിട്ടൺ റീ റിട്ടൺ ടോൾഡ് ആൻഡ് റീ ടോൾഡ് ഇൻ സോ മെനി ലാംഗ്വേജസ് എക്രോസ് across south asia and in every language if you look you know i am not going to name the meganatha pampa kampar tulasidasa so i i can name a hundred uh, writers of ramayana in india and all of them have written these ramayanas in different ways characters are different episodes are different the importance of, the relative importance of each character is uh, different the proportion given to the episodes uh, is different and the settings are different Uh, i have traveled almost uh, uh, across india uh, completely uh, across the world of course and uh, uh, across india and i have seen i have not seen any part any state in india where there are no places associated with the ramayana so i uh, so just to travel to vinad they will show you a lake saying this is the lake made by the tears of sita because sita was abandoned here in a forest in vinad and she wept because she she had been abandoned by her husband uh, in whom she had uh, uh, complete trust and uh, he had he had uh, betrayed her and uh, abandoned her there and she wept and wept throughout and these are the tears of that abandoned uh, uh, pregnant woman that you see here in the form of a lake so I, and, and, and you know we have a plan i think in in our, our parts of kerala i come from kodungallur uh, you know there is a plan called sita mudi uh, it's a it's a medicinal plant it's called sita mudi because uh, you know f- finally in the uttara ramayan you find sita disappearing into the earth you know sita when she is asked for a second fire test she calls her mother earth and earth takes her back into her womb and so when sita plunges uh, back into the earth one strand of her hair remains on earth and from that strand of hair this plant came to uh, uh, grow and multiply and that's why that plant is called sita mudi i'm just giving some uh, very familiar uh, examples as to how you know uh, uh, the, uh, the the story of ramayana is set in many different backgrounds if you read the odia ramayana you will imagine everything is taking place in orissa if you read kritibas ramayana you will think everything takes place in west bengal if you read tulasi ramayana you will see it takes place in different parts of 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 north india read pampa and you will think it is it is somewhere in south kanara south uh, south karnataka that the whole of ramayana is uh, uh, i mean it takes place so so you you find and and there are also a lot of tribal ramayanas and in all the tribal versions sita is a goddess of fertility uh, because many of these tribal uh, people are uh, uh, they live on uh, agriculture and there is there is a, a bheeli ramayana uh, called ram sita ani what i have been to gujarat i have lived with bheelis for a, for a few days uh, watching them pay, uh, making their murals or wall paintings and uh, in this bheeli ramayana sita is a goddess of uh, agriculture and uh, it is it is so it also in the ramayana by the of the vaigas another tribe uh, also of uh, 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 bhumayas another uh, agricultural tribe in all of them she is the goddess of uh, agriculture and uh, in in the in the bheeli ramayana in one of the bheeli, there are many bheeli ramayanas and in one of them uh, rama ravana's soul enters a bee and lakshman drops that bee in the boiling oil and kills it and that is how the avana is killed because they didn't want to portray a gory scene of uh, ravan being uh, you know uh, killed by 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 rama a scene of bloodshed because bhilis are generally peace loving people so they thought this is an easier way of uh, you know uh, killing the enemy so they they turned ravan into a bee uh, that is uh, dropped in the boiling oil and uh, and that's uh, that's killed and uh, in in the same ramayana hanuman also has a son called malsiraja who was born in a born to hanuman in a, in a fish and plants and bees are central to most of these uh, 
uh, tribal Ramayanas because they live among plants and bees and they consider them equals. They respect them unlike uh, the so-called civilized people do. And so uh, you, you find uh, bees and uh, plants and trees uh, appearing and reappearing in several scenes in Ramayana. The landscape becomes uh, extremely important. Well, uh, well, I will not go into a similar, uh, you know, uh, attempt at uh, 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 trying to explain the various kinds of Mahabharata. Uh, let me not do that because uh, how, you know how it grew from 8,000 verses to more than more than a lack of verses that you find in modern Mahabharata. And you have, I'm sure, you have read a lot about the various versions of uh, Mahabharata. So I, I said this as I said something about the diversity of Ramayana only as a kind of preface to what I wanted to say. So that alone is enough to show how plural our tradition is. If a single text could be interpreted in so many ways, or, or, or if the same story could be narrated and re-narrated in so many modes, in so many forms, in so many languages, you can imagine the diversity of the whole of Hindi literature, which is full of stories. Ramayana is just one of them. There are thousands of Ramayanas and there are thousands of stories told by the writers of epics because our epics, again, let me say, they are, they are, they are not confined to Ramayana and Mahabharata alone. So there are several oral epics. I do not know whether you have heard of Pabuji, which is a Rajasthani epic, completely different from It has nothing to do with Ramayana and Mahabharata. I do not know whether you have heard of Malla, Malle Madeshwara, which is a Kannada ep folk epic, where someone called Madeshwara, a, a tribal go a folk god, is the hero. So there are many such tribal epics also as part of the Indian tradition. It is not that Indian epics simply mean uh, uh, Ramayana and, uh, and, and, and Mahabharata. Now I will uh, I will come to uh, three major views about Indian literature, and I will try to look at these three views a, a bit closely, and then come to uh, my own conclusion uh, about them. So, in fact, all those who have tried to study uh, Indian literature have been baffled by this impossible diversity, this impossible plurality of uh, in, in in literature in uh, uh, um, li literature it was niharanjan ray the great bengali critic who said there cannot be anything called indian literature because literature is always language based and there is no language called indian language we have so many languages we have a whole varied landscape of languages so he said i am quoting him in uh, sujit mukherjee's english translation from his bengali Literature is absolutely language based and language being a cultural phenomenon, it is all but wholly conditioned by its locale and the socio-historical forces that are in operation through the ages in that particular locale. If that be so, one may reasonably argue that the literature of a given language will have its own specific character of a form and style, images and symbols, nuances and associations. So, which means the framework of a grand of, of a grand narrative of history cannot really accommodate the subversive function of the various trends which have come up in Indian literature from time to time. You cannot domesticate, you cannot canonize all these various subversive movements. By subversive movements, I mean also uh, movements like the Bhakti movement, of which I have been, as I said, a very close student. Why was it? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I don't want to again uh, deviate into that. Uh, I, I will just say why I called Bhakti, I, because I, it came out of my mouth, so I should say, uh, why do I call Bhakti tradition a, a subversive tradition? Because the Bhakti poets, uh, the vast majority of them questioned the superiority of Brahmins. They rejected priesthood. They rejected the hegemony of Sanskrit and spoke or sung, sang in regional languages. They rejected the Varna system. They rejected the caste system. They 
uh, dreamt of an egalitarian world where all human beings have been created equal by the same God. And they, 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 those, sometimes they called the God by different names. Like, uh, it was Ram for Kabir, it was Krishna for, uh, for, for Surdas or Meera. So, so they, he was, it was Vitrala for uh, Tukaram. So they called uh, him by many names, but all of them meant the same. For, for all of them. They, they meant something like uh, the Brahma of the Upanish, Upanishads, the eternal energy, or the, or the one from which the many have come, or one to which the many return, the, uh, the, the essence whose phenomena all of us are. So in that sense, the Bhakti poets were trying to create a popular religion uh, which was completely contradictory to uh, the established idea of a Brahminical religion, where the priests enjoy high privilege, where religion is divided into castes and sub-castes and sub-sub-castes, uh, and, and, and where it becomes a divisive force, as it is becoming in India today. So they, they rejected these divisions, and they spoke of uh, religion as something so, something singular, whatever the whatever uh, uh, the, uh, the name, you know, Kabir speaks of uh, Allah and Ram in the same spirit, and you 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 find Guru Nanak speaking of Jesus Christ and uh, and Allah and 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 uh, and, and Rama and Krishna in the same spirit uh, as being the name of the same God, and even Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, you know, uh, you know, went into meditation and came and he lived in different religions uh, in different months and came out and said, I did not find any difference between Christianity and Islam and, and Hinduism. I found the same God everywhere. So this, this is the tradition. Uh, this, this becomes a subversive tradition only because our hegemonic tradition happens to be another tradition created by the priests, by the, by the Savarnas, by the Brahmins, by, the, by those who are in, in power in more than one sense of the word, physically in power and spiritually in, uh, uh, in power. So that is why a, a single term called Indian literature cannot contain uh, the, the dynamism or the subversive dynamism of all these uh, different uh, movements and trends that happened from time to time. The leveling effect of history and the domestication implicit in canonicity finally fossilize authors and works, leaving no trace of their relevance to our present. We also have to recognize the fact that the gap between the national and the regional has been problematized by the post-colonial vocabularies of identity and difference and centrality and plurality. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read uh, Aija Sahamada's uh, book, In Theory, which uh, opens with a chapter on Indian literature. And Aija Sahamada also discusses the terms of the constitution of Indian literature. And he makes uh, uh, a wonderful observation, perhaps only a Marxist like him can make. He says, we can assert the category of Indian literature as a necessary corollary of the very civilizational unity of the peoples or as a consequence of the equally real centralizing imperatives of the modern nation state. But of the thing itself, Indian literature, we know very little. So we know very little about what we generally call Indian literature. But when you actually peruse or when you meditate or when you contemplate or when you go uh, deep into Indian literature to get an insight into it, you find that you know very little about what is generally called uh, Indian literature. So it's a term that is bandied about a lot, but uh, uh, about, about which we have very little knowledge because the term actually came from our attempt to create a nation. It was, it was an appendix to the, the idea of the Indian nation. And for me, uh, as for me, I believe that India is a nation in the making. And I also believe that Indian literature is a, a literature in the making. It is always in the process. 
and that is why we have problems even even in, in india you find sometimes some states want to be divided into two or three states some languages come up for recognition there are rebellions happening in the northeast or there are you know the there is the application of 370 or or the i mean i mean uh, the 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 removal of 370 applied to kashmir so you find why do you find all this which means india is still in the making it is it is it is, it is a process rather than a product and this can be said also of indian literature uh, it is a kind of process we are we are creating slowly creating in our own very 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 different ways uh, uh, an indian literature which will uh, uh, combine perhaps all these literatures in different ways uh, and uh, from which uh, perhaps a new uh, genealogy and a new cartography of literature will finally emerge so while speaking of the singular and uh, 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 yes uh, and the plural we we need to uh, uh, remember also of uh, what ramanujan calls uh, the little traditions and the uh, great tradition uh, or the or, or what uh, what is also called marga and deshi uh the uh, so the deshi tradition the regional tradition and there there are the margas the various kinds of uh, regional uh, way, regional traditions and uh, ramanujan himself has said and this needs to be said again perhaps with a greater emphasis today that uh, all the regional literatures were not various forms of a single national literature in fact what we call national literature today was created constructed out of these various regional literatures and there was no one way traffic from the national to the regional it is not that vatmigi wrote one ramayana and then people from all languages began to translate that ramayana or or make uh, various adaptations of that ramayana that is not how it happened are sure that valmiki created the ramayana out of the many uh, folk ramayanas that had already been in, in circulation in india at that of, at that point of time and he used his extraordinary creative genius to create that beautiful uh, work uh, which we now call valmiki ramayana so uh, so there has always been a conversation between the deshi and the margi Between the between what is called a national and what is called regional, and and this conversation was never a one-way command. It, it was not a command from above. The nation telling the region do this, do that, like the central government is telling Kerala or telling the states today. Uh, they 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 make even laws about agriculture, which is which is a completely state subject. they they make uh, uh, new education policies uh, which uh, which should be should have been properly discussed in the states because it is partly a state subject so uh, so so this is not how uh, indian civilization was created it was not that uh, somebody commanded from above okay uh, there is ramayana there is this one drama which you can see on all the posters with a with a bow and arrow that huge uh, battling uh, or uh, battle ready drama there are other dramas there are there is an affectionate drama there is a lover in drama there is that uh, there is a drama who is completely broken at the disappearance of sita and, and who and who uh, goes uh, crying and asking the trees in the forest have you seen my sita asking the birds asking the asking the bees have you seen my sita when sita disappears from the forest even in uh, even those who are familiar with elthach and satyakma ramayana uh, we will know all, all these so it is not a single drama even within ramayana and and if you want to create a particular image of rama which suits your purpose and your politics you are doing an injustice also to rama and to ramayana and the whole of the ramayana tradition and not only not only to the, to the other religions you are you are already alienating other religions you are othering them you are uh, you are creating enemies out of them uh, but you are also uh, uh, suppressing and uh, twisting and uh, turning and uh, distorting what has been called the hindu tradition or the many hindu traditions that have existed in india for several ages so oh, so that is why even a righteous hindu has a very right to question hindutva uh, because we have had 
and uh, well, I am deviating a bit. Excuse me. Uh, we have had an argumentative tradition. Um, you must have read. I am. I am sure Amartya Sen's ar uh, uh, argumentative Indian. So we have had always a tradition of argument. Our philosophy was never a single philosophy. We, even Advaita was not one Advaita. There was Vishishta Advaita and there was the other Advaita. And there, and there was Sankhya and there was Charva, Charvaka and there was Vaisheshika. We had different systems of philosophy. We had different epics. We had different stories to tell. And so if, when you speak of a single India and a single Indian literature, you are in the great danger of neglecting, othering, ignoring a lot of literatures, a lot of cultures, a lot of languages, and obviously a lot of uh, sections of uh, of people. So, so, so that is why we need to look even at the relationship between the Margi and the Deshi in a new way and understand the exchanges that happened between uh, uh, between between them. So it is true that combative literature uh, scholars uh, um, like K. M. George or Shishar Kumar Das have tried to create. Uh, histories of uh, Indian literature, but they have always finally failed. You know, I remember because it was uh, when I was uh, the head of the Haiti uh, Academy that uh, Shishir Kumar Das was commissioned to write uh, a history of Indian literature. He had submitted a proposal. He said, I am going to write an integrated history of Indian literature. I had great doubts about it. and I, I told Shishir Da, he is no more, he is a very, very, very great scholar. Uh, I, I told him, do you think it is really possible? He said, yes, yes, I think I can do that. And he tried. He wrote two volumes, came back to me and said, Sachi, I don't think I can really do that. Because when I look at regional literatures, I find it is so diverse that it's impossible. I can find here and there some comparisons. There are some common trends, there are some common movements, there are shared moments in the, in the trajectory of their evolution. But it is difficult to uh, to create a composite history, an integrated history of uh, Indian literature. And finally, he had to abandon uh, the project. And that was not only the experience of a scholar like Shishar Kumar Das, but almost all the scholars who tried to create such a single histories of Indian literature or a single story of Indian literature have finally failed because they have they came across uh, the specificity of each of the literature in India and they found that uh, uh, the argument for a single literature cannot really uh, st uh, stand ultimate ultimate scrutiny because this idea of Indian literature in some sense came from the Orientalist there is a there is a whole Orientalist trap uh, into whose uh, elaborate description I do not go because in order to do justice to this plurality and difference of Indian literature we need to escape the Orientalist forms. That's all I want to say. The Orientalist forms of historiography, ethnography, and of uh, anthropology that are based on a positivist and colonial epistemology that organizes its subjects in a fixed chronological hierarchy. That is what the Orientalists then did. They wanted to create a simple history. So they left out the history of debates, discussions, the history of collaborations, of complicity, the history of contests among colonialism, orientalism, and nationalism. So they, they wanted to create a kind of uh, identity, a composite cultural identity, uh, and ignore uh, the various kinds of um, differences that actually defined uh, the richness uh, of Indian, Indian culture and of Indian literature. They, they ignore the nuances of uh, our literature and culture in the attempt to create a fixed and chronological hierarchy. It was a creation partly of anthropology and partly of uh, the Orientalist form of, uh, of history. Of course, this has been dealt with in detail in, in, in several books in Sumit Sarkar's A Critique of Colonial India, Ashish Nandi's uh, The Illegitimacy of Nationalism, Rabindranath Tagore and the Politics of the Self. Uh, K. N. Panikir's Asia and Western Dominance, a survey of uh, the Vasco da Gama epoch in Asian history. Uh, then Culture, Ideology, Hegemony again by K. N. Panikir, Intellectuals and Social Consciousness in Colonial India. Uh, Colonialism, Culture and Resistance again by him. And Partha Chatterjee's The Nation and Its Fragments, Colonial and Postcolonial Histories. 
So these are some important examples of, uh, you know, almost subaltern histories of uh, uh, India, where they question the Orientalist notion, the Western notion of Indian history completely, and look at the history of arguments and contestations among different systems and different uh, uh, different philosophical trends and different literary movements. So they understood the duality of colonial modernity and the uh, the subject positions it engendered like the ambivalence occasioned by the fear of colonial intrusion into Indian culture on the one hand and the inherent problems especially of social discrimination and irrational beliefs within the culture itself on the other I, and, and I, I think it is Kane Panikar who sums it up uh, uh, beautifully uh, when he says I am quoting him the colonial conquest underlined the weaknesses of the traditional order and the need for reform and regeneration in its institutions an alternative however was not envisaged entirely in the western model presented by colonial rule mainly by the apprehension aroused in the Indian mind by the cultural and intellectual engineering of the colonial state as part of its strategy for political political control so if you look at the early histories of, of uh, Indian literature uh, you know they are all called history of Indian literature uh, you know from Albert Weber to Max Muller uh, Robert Gowen I mean there, there are, there are uh, several uh, at least 14 histories of Indian literature written by uh, Europeans many of them English some of them German some of them French some Belgians some Dutch and uh, all these are called histories of Indian literature. But when you actually uh, look through them, you find that uh, they are all histories of Sanskrit literature. And they called Sanskrit literature Indian literature. Sometimes, okay, they refer to one Pali text or a Prakrit text or an Abhapramsha text or a Paisaji text. But not, not even to a single text in Tamil, which is almost as ancient as Sanskrit, not to speak of Canada, which is a thousand years old, and several other languages of India, which have a history of uh, 900 to uh, uh, 500 to 600 years. So, the, no mention. And remember, all these histories were written either in the late 19th century or in the early 20th century, by which time all our major regional literatures had come up in a big way. And they had established their own identities as different regional literatures of India. So that is the original sin. They called uh, uh, their histories, history of Indian literature. That is, the, that is the general title of most of these histories. History of Indian literature. A history of Indian literature. But actually what they called Indian literature was Sanskrit literature and uh, little else. And uh, so th that is why people later began to speak of the unity of Indian literature because they found certain things common to Sanskrit literature which they thought were common to all literatures of in India which uh, which uh, which was not true so that, that is why Ganesh Devi another of my friends uh, whom I'm sure many of you know or have read uh, uh, points out how the Indian scholars have inherited their sense of history from the European Indologists of the 19th century with the disastrous consequences which according to him are mainly two uh, i'm quoting him again one the question whether india ever had any sense of literary history of its own before the contact with the modern west became a permanently sealed question and two there exists an inevitable gap between the nature of histories of various indian literatures and the master narrative employed to construct these histories. So he points to the disjunction between the so-called main tradition and the so-called sub-traditions, or the Margi and the Deshi, or the national and the and the and and, and the regional. So uh, and you can of course uh, trace it back to Edward Said's the Orientalism and the critique of uh, Orientalism that you find in uh, thinkers like Edward Said, or you can go to Lebanese Tagore. Uh, his lectures on nationalism, where he uh, uh, he creates uh, a wonderful and detailed critique of the ideology of nationalism itself as a dangerous and uh, fatal uh, belligerent ideology. 
uh, I have written a, a long essay on uh, that called the pathography of uh, nationalism. So, uh, so, so, you, so there is uh, there is a whole history of the critique of uh, such uh, uh, monolithic nationalisms, and it is this monolithic nationalism which was originally an Orientalist creation that has also come to define what is today called Indian literature that we often mistakenly speak of in the in the in the single. Well, I was I was uh, coming to those uh, three views about Indian literature, uh, of which I, I presented one, that is Nihar Ranjan Ray saying that there cannot be an Indian literature because there is no single language called, uh, called Indian. Of course, some people have tried to argue against that, saying that the literature is not entirely dependent on language. If you look at uh, the criticism of literature, literary texts, you find so many methods are employed. You know, uh, you, uh, you take uh, Matthew Arnold, you like uh, write from Sir Philip Sidney uh, to modern uh, modern critics like uh, Ranci or Agamben uh, or Raymond Williams. Uh, or, uh, so you so you can approach literature from a class point of view, from a caste point of view, like you find in Dalit literary criticism. You can approach it from a feminist point of view. You can approach it from a structuralist or a semiotic uh, point of view. You can approach it from a psychological or psychoanalytical point of view, like uh, Freud did or Pierre Machery uh, very much did much later. Or Althusser also, you know, takes a lot from uh, Pierre Machery. So uh, you find that uh, literature can be read in different ways from different points of view. So language is not the only basis of uh, literature. But then. The argument against that is that ultimately literature is born within language, from language, and remains within that language ultimately, even when it gets transformed uh, uh, in uh, through various translations in different languages. It is true. It takes many incarnations in many languages through adaptations and translations. But ultimately, if there is no language, there is no literature. So language remains the basis of Indian literature, uh, uh, Indian literatures, and hence uh, uh, Niharan Janre had a major point when he said there is no single language in India, and hence there cannot be a single literature, there can only be many Indian literatures, there is no harm in using the word Indian literature, but you should have in mind that it is something that, uh, that should express the many literatures being written in India across several different languages. And the second was the very opposite view that was held by S. Rathagashan. And I have often uh, laughed uh, to myself thinking of it uh, because Rathagashan said, there is only one Indian literature which is written in many languages. Why did I laugh? Because, you know, Rathagashan was an Advaitic philosopher. And Advaitins believe there is only one Paramatma and all the Jeevatmas are the various forms of that Paramatma. So there is one essence and all the phenomena are the expressions of that one essence. So it is quite natural, uh, I'm not laughing at him, but only thinking of uh, the connection. Uh, that, that, uh, so for him, it is quite natural to think there is something called Indian literature out there. And all these people are writing in Malayalam and Tamil and Punjabi and Bengali, etc. They are all writing the same literature in various languages, which, which uh, completely ignores you know, the difference between the cultures from which they come, the characters in the fiction, the forms of poetry, the, the, the various kinds of uh, knowledge systems and belief systems that inform the literature. So there's a lot of uh, neglect there of the specificity of literatures. When you say all literatures are one, or, or Indian literature is one, even though it is written in different, uh, uh, different languages. And there's a third approach. Uh, to which I have some kind of sympathy. Uh, that was uh, a statement made, uh, casually made by uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Yuvarananda Murthy, who, who said in a speech, he, he said it almost casually, but I thought it was very important. He always makes such a very important statements very casually. He said, when we begin to look for the, uh, uh, for the unity of Indian literature, we come across its diversity. And we look for the diversity of Indian literature, we come across its unity. I think this is a dialectical statement which comes much closer to the truth 
than the two statements that were made by the Haranjan Ray as well as by S. Radhakrishnan. Because you, you can find points of comparison among different literatures of India, but there are also a lot of points which, uh, which are very specific to each of the regional literatures of India. I will just look at uh, the arguments for the singular and the plural and close my talk, which is already, which has already taken a lot of time. So uh, arguments for the, for the, for the singular, one is that Indian literature, literatures have a common history of evolution because all of them begin with uh, tribal literature, then they pass through a folk stage, then there is the Bhakti movement which begins in Tamil with the great Tamil Shaivites like Tirumular who inspired uh, major philosophers like Sri Narayana Guru uh, in the 6th century BC. Uh, I mean, the Tamil, Tamil Shaivites uh, lived. Um, yeah, and then from Tamil, it passes on to Kannada in 11th and 12th centuries. And then it comes to other languages. It, it, uh, Maharashtra is close to Karnataka, so it goes into Marathi. Then it travels further north. And then you have Kabir and Meera and all that. So before that, you have Nanak. Before that, you have Kabir and, um, you know, uh, 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 Meera uh, and, and Surdas and other people. Uh, you uh, you have also uh, Muslim uh, bhakti poets uh, like Rahim or Rasa Khan or uh, Salabega of uh, Odisha who were uh, uh, devotees of uh, Krishna uh, or, or Rama as in the case of Kabir. So uh, so there was this bhakti literature which is which uh, um, spreads across centuries from the sixth century to the nineteenth century. You will find. Poets who have been called traditionally bhakti poets. Uh, so, so that uh, and it has it has been called retrospectively. These poets were not aware; they were not they were part of a movement. But retrospectively, we call it the bhakti movement. So, the there is a tribal beginning, then there is a folk uh, uh, continuation of it, then there is the bhakti movement, and then there are other movements uh, like uh, uh, the movement, the freedom movement. You know all the literatures of India, you find literature related to uh, decolonization or anti-colonial struggles uh, and also uh, social reformist literature and then you find the progressive literature and then you find modern literature, then you find various kinds of what have been generally called, I don't agree with that, postmodern literature uh, which includes Dalit literature, feminist literature and nativist literature various modern tribal literature and all of them. So if you look very broadly at Indian literature, you may be able to find a common pattern of evolution. That is the first argument for the commonness of Indian literature or for calling Indian literature singular. But how do we actually uh, look at that evolution? If you look at, if you look at it very closely, you will find that all these movements did not exist in the same manner across languages. If you look at the Bhakti movement, first there were different kinds of Bhaktas. The, Sh the Shaktayas, the Vaishnavites, the Shaivas, and there were, sometimes there were major battles between the Shaivites and the, and the Vaishnavai, Vaishnavites, as we very well know. And then there were also uh, uh, Advaitins and Vishishta Advaitins. There were some people who rejected the Advaita philosophy. There were Sankhya thinkers who, who followed the, 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 the passage of Buddha to some extent. So there were various uh, systems of philosophy that the Bhakti poets followed. Not only that, when, it, when you come to the, uh, to the forms that the Bhakti poets uh, employed, you, you find these forms were very different. Of course, there were epics, there were various kinds of plays, like the, you, like the Ram Leela or the, or the, or the Ram Katha or, or, the various, or, or in Malayalam you have something like the, like the Atta Katha. So we, uh, we, and there are various kinds of dances, which, most of which were products of the Bhakti movement, like uh, uh, Manipuri or Bharatanatyam or, or, or Kuchipudi or many of these uh, classic, uh, classical dances which have their origin in, in, in Bhakti. And uh, so, so you find uh, uh, many of these things 
or, uh, uh, originated in different parts of India in different forms and many of the Bhakti poets believed in different deities or different systems of uh, philosophy and their forms were also uh, different. You know, if you, if you look at uh, 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 Kabir, you find Kabir uses uh, forms like uh, uh, Doha, uh, Bijak, uh, Ramayani, uh, uh, Bhasi. Uh, I, I just completed a, a, a book of uh, Kabir translation, so I'm very familiar with these forms. So these are very different forms that Kabir invented in order to create his, his kind of Bhakti poetry. But when you go to, uh, say, Tukaram, whom I am translating now, you find Tukaram uses mostly a form called Afang. And if you go to Lal Ded, uh, the Shaivite uh, poet, who is also a Sufi poet, by the way, of Kashmir, uh, she uses a form called Vak, V-A-K-H, uh, uh, Vak. And when you go to uh, the Kannada poets, whom again I have translated, uh, a whole book of uh, Kannada Bhakti poets like Basavanna and Akka Mahadevi, and they use a form called Vachana. So, so th these are only some examples. So if you look at uh, Namadev and Tukaram and uh, Basava and Kabir and uh, Miravai and others, you find all of them use different kinds of forms, different genres of literature. They worship the different gods. And also you have to take into account another parallel movement, which is the Sufi movement in India, which came originally from Iran, but which took very different forms in India, which also produced very, very great, uh, uh, great poets like Shah Abdul Latif or, uh, or, or uh, Bulle, Bulle Shah, on whom I have written a poem. So, so there were many, many poets like that who, uh, who called themselves Sufi poets. And Sufi poetry is very close to Bhakti poetry in many ways because they also rejected the you know, caste system and, the, and uh, religion in the narrow and insular sense of the word. They also believed in a, in a single uh, god or a single... Uh, God is a very, very Western word, actually. In India, we don't have that kind of a concept, really speaking. We have a concept of Brahma, which is very different, you know, which you find in the uh, Upanishads, which is uh, something which you cannot see, you cannot hear, you cannot learn, you cannot teach. Um, uh, that is how Kaino kind of Upanishad speaks of Brahma, something you cannot... Uh, uh, the eyes do not go there. The words don't, do not go there. You cannot learn it. You cannot teach it as it is to the disciples. So, uh, so we have that kind of a concept and not uh, the concept of God that you often obtain in the Western discourse. So the Sufis and the Bhaktas believed in that kind of a God, which even an atheist can perhaps believe in. Because it speaks only of a kind of uh, intelligence that works through the entire nature, that works across uh, the various planets, that works across the cosmos. And so uh, Sufis, uh, philosophically, were very close to the Bhakti poets. So in short, Bhakti movement was not a uniform movement. Even though now it looks like a uniform movement, it looks, uh, when you uh, look in retrospect, it looks like a movement, but it is not uh, a uniform movement as it is uh, supposed, often supposed to be. And this can be said about later movements also. The social reform movement reflected in literature. So the problems that the Bengalis had to face were not the problems that the Malayalis had to face. And the Bengali Renaissance and the Malayalam Re Kerala Renaissance are very different from each other. Because the Bengali Renaissance was mainly a reform movement led by the upper castes, while the Kerala Renaissance movement was essentially a subaltern movement. It had, of course, people from other castes, but it was mainly subaltern, inspired by a philosopher like Sri Narayana Guru, and also led by a lot of uh, subaltern uh, leaders, uh, including, you know, K.P. Karupan and Ayyengali, and also people from other, other, uh, uh, other religions and other, other, other castes, like, uh, like uh, Poigail Apachan, uh, for, for example, so we are, or, or Abraham Malpan, for example. So we had people from different religions. We had people from the subaltern castes who all led the Kerala Renaissance. That's why I always say 
please don't compare Kerala's renaissance with Bengal's renaissance, which was a Brahminical reformist movement. While well, ours was a subaltern reformist movement, and uh, and that is why uh, Kerala's uh, communism also has something to do with the Kerala's uh, Kerala Renaissance because it was essentially subaltern and hence uh, egalitarian in uh, in character, much more than so. If, if the writers that Bengal produced during Renaissance and the writers that Kerala produced during Renaissance were also different, and this can be said about uh, other movements also. The progressive uh, work of Prem Chand cannot be easily compared to the progressive works produced by, say, Tagadi Shiva Shankar Pillai in Malayalam, to take two major examples from two different languages. And this is, this is true about modernism. So, if you look, because uh, if you look at the works of B. Uh, uh, Martekar, you know, Martekar was the, was the first uh, Indian modernist uh, who wrote in Marathi in the 1940s. He, he introduced uh, the T.S. Eliot like modernism in poetry in Marathi language in the 1940s. But uh, Martekar is very different from somebody like uh, Gobalakrishna Adiga, who was the pioneer of modernism in Kannada, it's modern poetry in Kannada literature. And, and 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 Adiga is very different from somebody like Ayyappa Panikar in Malayalam. And Ayyappa Panikar is very different from somebody like Kana Subramaniam in Tamil uh, or Agge or Muktibodh in Hindi. So if you look at the uh, modernisms in Indian languages, you will find they, they not only arose at different periods of history, they also had different uh, ways of looking at life different ways of articulation, different genres and different forms of uh, expression. And this is uh, uh, also true of the lit literature, of feminist literature, of, and of the various kinds of so-called movements in Indian literatures. They had some common points, but when you look at actual specific texts, they were also very, very different. So the, the, uh, uh, the statement that uh, Indian literature had a common pattern of evolution does not hold good. There were points of comparison, but there were also a whole lot of differences uh, among them. And, uh, and there were also, as I said, forms which were co confined to particular lit literature, because Tamil had, you know, uh, uh, forms like uh, Chind, Akaval, Venpa, ka uh, Kalipa, uh, Kummi, which later came also into Malayalam. And then and Malayalam had Atakatha, Tullal, we have something called Patala Katha, which uh, no other Indian language has. So, or almost all uh, Urdu has uh, Rubai and Masnavi and Khawali and Kitta and Makniba and Nama and Kasida. So these are specific to Urdu. So if you look at the forms of literature also, you find there are a lot of differences among Indian languages. Each language has its own uh, different forms of literature. And the third point uh, uh, is about uh, the use of critical concepts. It is true, sometimes Sanskrit and sometimes Western critical concepts are used in different languages, but they are used in different contexts, applied to different texts, and also used with different, uh, different uh, meanings or different uh, suggestions, different connotations, if I, can, if I can say so. And they are again not uniform. If you, be, if you speak to uh, a Chhattisgadi writer, and you begin to speak about uh, uh, Foucault's genealogy, or, or about uh, Lac Derrida's deconstruction uh, that Charkhand writer or a critic may never have heard about it. Novel and short story are still very young uh, uh, in uh, a, a language like uh, Kashmiri. So if you look at uh, forms and if you look at critical concepts, you will find they came at different stages in different literatures and also entail them with uh, very different meanings and connotations. And the origins of our languages also happened in different periods. Uh, see, and, and we also speak of a period of the, the, the domination of Sanskrit literature. But imagine it was at the same time that Sangam literature in Tamil existed in the south. So you cannot say uh, Sanskrit literature was a particular stage of uh, the evolution of Indian literature because Sanskrit literature coexisted with uh, Sangam literature in Tamil and also with a lot of Pali literature, especially Buddhist and Jain literature written in Pali. 
So it was not again uh, a single movement that happened at that point of time. And this is true. If you take any point of time in Indian literary history, you cannot have a common cross section that will show you all that was happening simultaneously in the same fashion in all the languages and literatures of India. So, so, the, so the languages themselves originated in different periods. As I said, this Tamil and Sanskrit may have at least 3,000 years of history. Kannada has 1,500 years of history. Marathi and Malayalam may have 800 years of history or even more if you take into account the earlier stage when Tamil and Malayalam were almost one. Odia has 500 years of history. Indian English has uh, something like 200 years of history. And then we have various languages and, uh, and also various dialects. Uh, even though I don't like the word, because there is this uh, famous saying that a dialect becomes a language when a dialect gets an army and a political party. Actually, it happened in India when Bodo language was recognized, when Santali language was recognized by the eighth schedule of the Constitution of India. It happened only because Bodos and Santalis, uh, you know, they had an army. I mean, they had a, they organized themselves politically and they wanted their languages to be included. Why languages like Bhojpuri, which has more speakers than either Sandali or Bodo, are not still included in the eighth schedule. So forget the dialect and the language. Any dialect can any time become a language. So we have, in short, so many languages. I'm not going uh, to examine that uh, because that is another area altogether of the of our linguistic landscape. Because we have eight uh, language families, we have around 800 languages, uh, and we have so many other spoken languages and tribal languages. And so it is a very very varied and complicated landscape whose history is also not exactly very clear because in every census you will find the numbers. Uh, 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 varying. And again, you have to ima imagine influences. That is another point of comparison. You can say, uh, they say that uh, there are common influences in Indian literature. Yes, sometimes it is true, but the influences did not enter all literatures at the same time. In fact, many influences came together to Indian, liter Indian uh, literatures. For example, uh, the romantic and the modern came into our language literatures almost at the same time. And even now, as E.V. Ramakrishnan has uh, uh, rightly pointed out, there are many times coexisting at the same time in our literary history. Even if you look at Malayalam poetry today, you will find Malayalam poets write, some poets write in a very con a conversational, day-to-day -day kind of language. There are some poets who use a kind of... A, higher vocabulary with a lot of Sanskrit in it. And there are poets who write uh, uh, in, uh, in what are called dialects used by fishermen or the Marawa language. So there are many, uh, many coexisting times uh, at the same time in, the, in any period in the literary history of India because the many influences came at the same time and individual authors absorbed these influences in their own very different ways and so that is why you find meter is being used prose is being used free verse is being used in, uh, in in poetry in india in different languages even today and also remember literary histories cannot be dealing completely from native histories they have something to do with the histories of uh, regions uh, 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 the Malayalam, for example, uh, today you can speak of a single Malayalam literature, but if you go back, uh, you know, uh, we had Travancore and Cochin and Malabar, uh, which was part of the Madras province, uh, and Malayalam literature originated in all these parts of uh, India at that time. And Sangam literature in Tamil actually originated in what is today called Kerala. We often tend to think in terms of modern linguistic states, uh, and that creates a lot of, com uh, a lot of confusion. And uh, English was brought very early to the northeastern states of India by the, uh, by, uh, by, by the Scottish uh, missionaries. And, and, and Kerala also had Sanskrit literature. It is said that even Bhasa belonged to Kerala. There are some evidences, but it is not completely clear. But certainly, a lot of Sanskrit literature was also written in what is today called uh, uh, Kerala. And so we cannot, uh, there were differences in native histories, and so you cannot uh, uh, collate native histories with regional literary histories. 
and there were also sub traditions within the uh, within the traditions within the tradition of bhakti or uh, the, no, the tradition of novel or the tradition of travel writing you find a lot of many a lot of uh, sub traditions and so if you look at uh, all the arguments about uh, the uh, and, and one more thing i point i wanted to make it that we need to also um, broaden our concept of literature to include oral literature and performed literature especially when you speak of indian literature you cannot speak only of written literature because we have a long history a spectacular history of oral literature and performed literature a literature of kirtan of abhang of kista of uh, dastangoi of harikatha of buragatha of atakatha of tullal of krishnalila so we have a whole history of oral literature and performed literature and only if we include them we can really speak of uh, uh, indian literature in full and so uh, i i will i will I'll, i'll just conclude because uh, i wanted to say many more things but i just can't do because this is this is actually only a preface to a talk i wanted to make uh, uh, actually a book i am writing now of about 300 pages this, this will be only uh, a preface to that i will conclude uh, this uh, this uh, whole argument uh, with a few uh, sentences one is that we need new more inclusive histories of indian literatures as i said i would like to use the word plural when we use the word indian literature i can i am not taking the use of that particular word my problem is not with the word but what it conveys it should have an inclusive meaning which will communicate the the the, the wide range of uh, you know themes and forms and genres and histories and cultures and world views that exist in different regions of india and it should also include as i said oral performed and tribal literatures to make them complete literary histories we should look at periods of common influences but we should also look at periods of isolated growth when we look at the histories of different language literatures in short we need a new cartography that marks areas of uh, difference and also areas of similarity when you look at all these different literatures there are areas of similarity here and there but there are also major areas of difference as i said even shoners uh, as i said uh, uh, or tullal uh, or atakatha or patalagatha uh, they exist only in malayalam not in other languages of india and like i like i said also of the of, of, of urdu uh, like like kissa or kasida or many urdu forms exist only in the urdu language and so we have to look at these differences but we have also to look at uh, the possibilities of confluence there are certain points of confluence of uh, points uh, uh, where common influences have impacted literatures uh, simultaneously or at different points of period so we need a kind of new map a new map a new map making or a new cartography of indian literatures and so what we need is not an integrated history or it is not even possible of indian indian literature but a kind of comparative understanding of the various literatures of india because literature exists not uh, uh, does not exist in an empty space it, it it exists in a network of relationships of peoples and cultures and of languages it is not it does not exist in isolation and if you look at even the idea of a pratibha in india it is not an individual concept it is not an individual who is considered a pratibha uh, pratibha is a social phenomenon and a and genius is not uh, somebody who is born with uh, special genes uh, uh, in his body but uh, he or she is born into a particular period in literary history which happens to be a very fertile period things are happening uh, sometimes it can be a very tragic period also because james joyce says excuse us we are olives he is speaking about writers so we are like olives which yield the best olive oil when you press uh, press them so when we pass through tragic experiences sometimes the best in us uh, come uh, come forth like uh, when you speak of shakespeare you first speak of shakespeare's tragedies and and so uh, we we need to uh, look at these uh, uh, regional histories and and look at uh, the the interconnections as i said the networking of relationships of cultures and languages 
and also the connection between poetry and philosophy, which, which is very peculiar to uh, Indian, uh, Indian literature. Uh, because we find may, many of our texts, we are not sure how to call them. Uh, how to call a, 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 a text by Kabir, a text by Basava, a text by Meera, how to call a text by Lalded, a text by Namdev or Tukaram, how to call Bhagavad, what, what, how do you name Bhagavad Gita? How do you name the, the, the Dashamaskanta of uh, Bhagavata? It is pure philosophy. According to the Western scholar, uh, it will be philosophy. Gita is a philosophical text. And uh, uh, this part of Bhagavata, the, the 10th uh, canto, is a philosophical text. But for us, it is both poetry and philosophy. And poetry and philosophy have always coexisted in, in India. So this is something very, uh, very peculiar to uh, Indian way of thinking and looking at literature. So we, we need to look at communities, languages and regions which actually precede our national identity. Nation came much later. Even before the nation, we had communities, we had languages, we had a different, uh, a different, a different regions. And the idea of authorship also came much, much later. In, fa in fact, it uh, came from the West. Earlier, we did not have the idea of the authorship. Our folk songs, nobody knows who originally sang them or wrote them. And they went on changing from generation to generation. So folk songs are anonymous. And some of our early texts are also anonymous. Even Kalidasa, yes, we speak of a Kalidasa, but we know nothing about him except some stories we have heard about Kalidasa. And this is even more true about Vyasa, because now many scholars argue with enough evidence that there was no single Vyasa, but there were so many Vyasas, and all those who contributed to the evolution of Mahabharata came to be called Vyasa. So Vyasa is the name of a tradition and not the name of a particular person. So, uh, so uh, if you look at uh, authorship, even th that idea came much, much later. And the, the name, uh, the idea of the copyright, all these uh, uh, came to us just about 200 years ago. So Indian culture originally existed as regional cultures, and, uh, which were repositories of cultural memories, archives of regional imagination. And so we also ne uh, need... Uh, we need to know that single language cultures are in fact like, uh, uh, like pruned uh, gardens, but multilingual literatures like, the Indi like, uh, like in India is, a, is an endless dense forest. So Indian literatures form a kind of forest. If you look at uh, English literature or German literature or French literature, it is like a garden. It is like a well-pruned garden. You can speak of exact moments of evolution, exact movements and trends, but you cannot do that with Indian literature. It exists like a very dense and uh, fertile forest. So, so, in, so in short, if the French have a single tale to tell about their literature, Indians have many tales to tell. We have many stories to say. We can tell and we can we need to tell all these tales to understand our literature. Uh, and, and also remember, each of these tales will be incomplete. See, if you begin to uh, uh, tell the story of Malayalam literature, it will gradually lead us into Tamil literature. Because it will lead us to Ramacharya, it will lead, lead us to that uh, period of history when Malayalam was slowly emerging from Tamil, which could be called neither Malayalam nor Tamil. And then it will lead us further back into the uh, period of uh, Sangam literature. So it is very difficult even to say a single tale about a single literature and to say and to imagine that we can, uh, we can uh, tell a single tale about all these literatures is in fact, uh, in fact an, uh, extremely ironical, it is absurd. So we need to tell all the tales, understanding that even each of these tales is in some sense incomplete. So, and also let us remember, literature does not, uh, necessar uh, is not necessarily a part of uh, the nation building process. Well, you can you can call them by the name of the nation, but uh, they are they, they may have contributed also to nation building. But let us not conflate them. They are not the same thing. Uh, uh, speaking about India and speaking about Indian literature in the same breath, that is not perhaps uh, uh, completely possible because there can be a disjunction 
between what we call India and what we call the various Indian literatures. Literary history, in short, literary history is not a mere appendix to national history. Or it has its own aesthetic, uh, it has its own uh, identity, it has its own aesthetic geography. So we need literary histories that are that can represent our diversity of our religions, our races, our cultures, our languages. So we need to help uh, hear the suppressed voices and make the inaudible audible. You know, Rack Rancy, the great French thinker, uh, when he defines democracy, says demo the, the major function of democracy is to make the invisible people visible and to make the inaudible audible. So that is, uh, uh, for example, our assemblies or our parliaments should represent people whom we have never seen before and uh, be people whom we have, whose voices we have neglected, which means the minorities, the Dalits, the tribal people, the poor people, the workers, the peasants. Only then we can say we are a democratic people and a democratic country. As long as we have representatives of the upper classes or upper caste who claim to speak also for the subaltern classes, uh, then there is a problem. You, you, you can say formally it is a democracy, but in content it is not a complete democracy. Because if it should become a complete democracy, we need to hear the voices of those people whose voices we have never heard. We need to see the faces of those people whose faces we have never looked at. But in, in all our representative bodies, right from the panchayats and the municipalities and the corporations to our assemblies and parliaments. So the function of literature is also very similar. Because literature is an area of democracy, more than an area of mere nation building. It is, it is, it is a democratic uh, practice. And if it is a democratic practice, literature also is obliged to make these invisible uh, uh, forces visible and to, uh, and to make this, uh, these voices we have not so far heard audible. So we need to increase the space for politics by, by which I mean, not, not necessarily any party politics, but I mean the politics of dissent, the, the politics of opposition. So we need to, you, you remember our own great poet, Vailo Pulisri Menon, called the poets Savarna Pradipaksham, a golden opposition. That is how we defined poets in general. So, and this can be extended to literature in general, writers in general, because writers have never been, they, they, uh, they have always been critics of the system, because uh, uh, it is very easy to be part of the system, but it is very difficult sometimes to be against the system to and to speak about its problems, its inadequacies, its failures. And writers, I believe, are obliged to speak about the failures, the inadequacies, uh, the, 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 the problems, the conflicts, uh, the contradictions of the existing system or what we generally call the status quo. So uh, uh, that is what Vailopilli meant. Uh, po uh, poets or writers are always critics of the status quo. Why? Because they always dream of another society which is more egalitarian, which is more just, which is better in every sense. So so uh, uh, human progress, if we are progressing at all, is or should be towards a socialist society or ultimately what is called a communist society, which means a society of, uh, of people, of human beings who are treated as equals and not divided in terms of class or caste or religion or ethnicity or language. And so in order to move, move towards that, we need to have a lot of space for dissent and opposition. We need to listen to different voices, not only our own voice. And it is, and so uh, literature is in that sense, a space of uh, democratic politics. And that is why plurality or diversity becomes so central to any idea of literature and particularly to a literature like India's. Uh, literature, which actually consists of so many different regional and linguistic uh, uh, literatures. 
because plurality, uh, uh, diversity, difference, dissent, uh, uh, opposition, all these are extremely important to politics as also to literature. And this is the time when we need to repeatedly say, tell ourselves and tell other people that we need more space for disagreement, for dissent, for opposition. And it is not through suppression of dissent and silencing of uh, 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 differing voices uh, that democracy thrives. It is by allowing them to speak freely and to act freely and giving them all the fundamental freedoms that our constitution gives them. By defending our constitution, by defending our democracy, by defending our fundamental freedoms, that is how we actually will be able to turn our present formal democracy into a true democracy and our literature also into a truly democratic pluralistic, diverse literature and develop a diverse idea, a pluralistic and inclusive idea of Indian literature in general. Thank you so much for your patient hearing.